This is Creepy, a podcast dedicated to sharing the most famous, chilling, and disturbing creepy pastas and urban legends in the world. Whether these stories truly happened or are simply fabrications is for you to decide. These stories may contain graphic depictions of violence and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Creepy presents Death Letter Written by Grant Hinton and produced by Steve Blizzon. Dear Melody, this is the last letter I'm going to write to you. I'm not sure if you're getting these, and that scares me more than what's going on in my head. Being a soldier is hard. Do you remember what I made you promise? If you're reading this, please give it to Bobby. I want him to remember his dad. I've got to tell you so much, Mel, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid that if I put all this down on paper, then it makes it real, and I don't know if I can handle that. I first saw this thing during our halo drop. High altitude, low opening. The doors of the cargo hold opened. The wind roaring noisily out into the black void of space. It was so dark, Mel. You wouldn't understand. In London, the lights never go off. But on that plane, The only lights were the red jump lights behind us and the rhythmic splash of green and red and the cloud from the position lights on the wings. We were all nervous. Don't let anyone tell you their man wasn't. It's bullshit. Fear sat amongst us like a brother. But we had to be men. So I jumped. 30,000 feet is a long way down, Mel. And it goes by so fast. Bullets started to zip past as the ground lit up with enemy fire. I didn't know this at the time, but a few of the guys got picked off as the chutes opened. At 10,000 feet, I deployed mine and jerked up into a far scarier position. I could see the land better now. A dark gray mass of inhospitable sand and shabby buildings. As we dropped, a large hill appeared. I knew it would separate us from the enemy fire from the west. Over the clamor of gunfire and the wind, the commanding officer shouted to aim for it. I was barely able to keep myself high enough so as to not crash into the peak. That's when the thing flew past me as I crested the top. I shouldn't say thing, because I knew what it was as it sailed by. A boy. That's what it looked like. A farmer boy, dressed in strips of clothes and with a brown cloth covering his head. I came crashing down the side of the hill and straight into the clusterfuck of men from my airdrop. My units stared back at me with wild, unblinking eyes. Each and every one of us had the same white sheen etched onto our face by adrenaline. I only had a moment before I realized with horror that the kid on the hill could give away our position. I raced back up, the sand slipping in places. Some of the guys scrambled to help me. The gunshots and missile fire were so loud it became part of me. If I close my eyes, and I won't, I can still hear it like a heartbeat. I'm not proud of the decision I made next. It was either one child's life or the lives of my squadron. I thought about Bobby then, Mel. I was going to kill someone's son? I knew why. And I also knew I would. Does that make me a monster? I crept up behind the boy. His short and slender silhouette a weight on my soul. He neither turned or acknowledged my presence. I drew my knife and rammed it up and under where his chin should have been. But there wasn't anyone there but an assortment of rags laid out over cross sticks. 
bewildered by the sudden reality, panic set in. A bullet hit the ground a few millimeters from where I crouched. I didn't need any more encouragement. I half slid, half fell back down the hill to my waiting squad. Lachlan asked what I'd seen, but I brushed it off, telling him it was a false alarm. But our position had been compromised. We moved off in search of a better place to mount a defense. Do you remember that time we went to Canterbury and he wanted to ride a horse? We went to a stable and he spent the best part of the day riding while I got roped into helping the old man repair his barn. Well, that barn was in far better condition than the one we found a hole up in. I could see so many stars through the missing roof and holes in the wall that I might as well have been standing outside. For hours, we protected our position, waiting for an airstrike to relieve us of the heavy resistance we faced. And all the while I took enemy life, I saw that boy standing up on the same hill mocking me. The rational part of my mind told me it couldn't possibly be a boy. It was a makeshift scarecrow, nothing more. But I also knew it was a boy, because I could see the smile on his face. I don't know when exhaustion took me. I do remember it beginning to lighten as the moon dropped. But when I woke, it took me a moment to remember the carnage around me. The soft feeling my head used as a pillow was a deadened surgeon ass cheek. The darkness has its advantages, Mel. Namely, not being able to see the blood and gore covering you. All the blood that covered me wasn't my own. I suddenly felt sick. Sick of a war I'd only graced for a fistful of hours. A scream woke me to full wakefulness faster than a taser to the eyeball. Lachlan was wrestling with a young man. The screams came from a petrified girl on the floor behind him. It looked like the farmer who owned the barn had started work early and caught a sleeping. One of our unit rushed forward and brought the butt of his gun down on the man's nose, flattening it into his skull with each blow. But not before he had grasped Lachlan's knife and jammed it into his ribs. We dispatched the man and his woman quickly as a new sound. A sound blessed with all the intoxicating waves where a leaf rumbled around our position. The air support had showed up. But Lachlan was in bad shape. He needed a casualty evacuation ASAP. We managed to relay our coordinates as soon as the helo arrived. I cradled Lachlan, trying to stem the blood leaking from his side with a cloth from his pocket. A British cloth, once a stark white, lost its virginity on Afghan soil. We got him to the helicopter while exchanging enemy fire. We all knew he wasn't going to make it. The wound was too deep. Already his lungs were filling up with blood. But the Kasavak took him, and an armored vehicle loaded the rest of us up and sped off. I looked back once as we left the ruins of the village and saw the boy standing on top of the hill. His smile was gone, replaced with empty air as the boy disappeared. Do you remember the marquees we used for your mother's 50th birthday? When we came to the base, we were ushered into one similar in height and length, but not in content. While we all danced and drank under a winter night that night, the guys sat or laid in rows of gray cloth cots. No one smiled. It was as if by some unspoken agreement, no one wanted to share what we'd been through. We all wanted to voice the horrors we had seen and done, but none wanted to bring them to life either. It was a silent solitude, a vigil of violence. Two days later, I was sitting in the base when a guy from my unit came back from his shift on the post, the garden point to our base. The Afghanistan landscape surrounding our location made the only entrance and exit through a pass we called the point. It was a triangular shaped ridge that ran for a kilometer around our base, providing enough cover from hostile forces. 
but we still needed a sentry tower, built like a wooden cubby house located at the start of the point as our first line of defense. Then it was manned by one person, day and night. The guy who'd come back from his shift was called Gary Anderson, a young guy out of Bristol, and he walked through like a ghost. I heard the rumors about our location being built around the mass graves of an earlier takeover. It never bothered me. I didn't believe in the supernatural. The guys whispered that the formations weren't natural at all, but rather the sheer magnitude of Afghani bodies hidden by the excavation of sand. (laughs) I didn't believe it. Not right away, anyway. Anderson stood by a cot, his gun still strapped over his shoulder. I knew something had rocked the kid because cleaning your gun is the first port of call when you're back. And I also saw the look in his eyes. Or the lack of. I remember looking into your eyes, Mel. Seeing the beauty in them. They filled my soul with something I couldn't hold or touch. But was still tangible at the same moment. It was like I saw your soul. The energy inside you. Anderson had none. The guy was drawn out. Sucked out completely and utterly lost to whatever had happened out in the post. I shook his shoulder and he turned toward me. I steered him out, helped clean his gun and returned him back to the tent. He hadn't spoken a word, although his lips constantly moved. It was as if he was whispering to someone only he could see and hear. Slowly I coaxed him out and he began to talk. What he said chilled me to the bone, even in the Afghan heat. He spoke about hearing screams coming from beyond the reaches of the searchlights. Maddening shouts filled with anguish, pleading, and dread. I don't know how long he endured them before calling for backup. But a search ensued. Everyone stated that they couldn't hear these screams. It was only Anderson. At that point, you're not allowed to leave your post, Mel. If you do, well, that's not the point. The point is that he was left at the post with no escape from whatever he thought was happening. If they were real or not wasn't a question. You've got to understand that we all have demons in our heads from the deeds we committed. And whatever he had just been through had shook him to the core that's not what sent chills through me, Mel. No. That was the mention of the boy up on the hill. I sat back then, the icy feeling of dread spreading down my back like a slow avalanche of fear. I described the boy I had seen. Anderson's face fell and his voice seized up. That day I woke to Anderson scrambling on the floor. I sat up and rubbed the sleep from my eyes. No one else was awake, or if they were, they refused to be found out. Curiosity got the better of me and I went to see if the guy was alright. He spoke in a whisper, but the words he spoke weren't English. The floor was a tapestry of marks and slashes. It took me a moment to realize what they were. Arabic. I copied them down before touching him. Anderson's eyes were closed, but he moved like he could see me, striking out with numerous blows. Each one connected with my face, even as I tried to dodge them. I grabbed his wrist and pulled him off his feet. In that moment, I saw something. I saw something I couldn't have seen in the darkness. Cut into his palms was a symbol. A crude drawing of a stick man on a hill. The tent came to life. My unit pounced on us both. Needless to say, our CO wasn't impressed. We were warned about our behavior. The next day, Anderson refused to man the post. Instead, he was left curled up on his cot, softly crying. Another of the guys took his shift. 
We are, after all, family here, and must watch out for each other. The next afternoon, Anderson was back to his normal self. I told him I'd swap his shift and man the post that night. But he refused it, saying it wasn't a problem, and he was almost looking forward to the peace and quiet. I thought that weird. One, because the screams he'd reported hearing. And two, he was petrified a day ago, refusing point blank to man the post. And that was the last time I saw Anderson. He went out on a scouting mission the next day. Local information suggested a band of insurgents holed up in some sort of cave four kilometers south of her base. We couldn't let any potential threats get that close. Two teams of six went on a desert train vehicle strapped with a 50 cal on the back to the location. We passed through a small village. The inhabitants hid frightened behind crumbling walls. It was eerie and wrong. Not wrong for what they were or how bad they had it, but just wrong. Like I felt it in my bones. The village sat on flat plains that stretched for miles. We didn't know what we were looking for until one of the DTVs fell through a patch of sand. The hole had been covered by a sheet of metal a few meters wide, the thin layer of sand blending it into the earth. The fall killed one of our men. The impact of the DTV and crushing rocks below its snap follows neck. But we didn't have reprieve. We came under attack. In moments like this, it's as if a switch is thrown. Your mind becomes tuned to the environment. Your heartbeat drowns out all sound for a second as the adrenaline rushes into your furnace and explodes along your nerves. My gun was already firing before I realized it. The cave was a hole cut roughly into the side of the earth. Big enough for two insurgents to stand side by side to fire at us. The DTV provided cover for the men below, but not for us, what we called it to base. A moment later, and the command to stand down and wait back up came through. Another man was killed then. Denva took a shot to the face. I and the surviving guy Jasper saw cover. Well, I did. Jasper stood there, gun slumped, face pale and unresponsive. I shouted, screamed for him to get down, but he didn't. Jasper dropped his gun, mumbling something incoherent. I thought for a second he said, he comes, before he jumped into the hole. I couldn't stop him, but I wasn't going to let him go alone. We were a unit. I jumped down and landed beside the other DPT. The two guys were already exchanging fire. With Harrison Maxwell, the three on two odds ended the fight quickly. But we would have been fools to think it was an end. As soon as the men fell, Jasper was off down the tunnel. We had to follow. It was dark, Mel. So dark. Like the airdrop in the cloud without the flashing lights. We turned on our gear and the tunnel flared up. Along the walls were scratches deep enough to fit my fingers in. As if something sharp was dragged against them. A horrible smell crept over us. It was like rotting garbage and shit. It was all I could do not to choke. The scratches ended as abruptly as they started. A flat piece of earth faced us, with a small hole only big enough to fit one man on his stomach. Above, scratched into the wall were a series of markings. I pulled out Anderson's strange writing and measured them up. They were the same. No one spoke Arabic, and no one knew what it meant. But we knew we had to press on. One by one, we squirmed through on our stomachs like snakes hoping to see Jasper. But we didn't. A sense of claustrophobia crept over me as I snagged on the jutting rocks. It was dark. So incredibly dark. 
and I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was pressing on top of me when no one possibly could. The rock held me fast like a claw from the earth. I drew in ragged breaths trying to calm myself, squeezed my hand down my side and unhitched my belt from the rock. The tunnel ended in a large precipice, and Jasper was nowhere to be seen. A cave opened up before us with no viable route down to the floor. The light from our gear was lost at the distance of the cave. As we shone the lights around, we saw what we could only believe were buildings cut from the rock. We had found an ancient, abandoned underground city. Each row of rough card blocks drew closer to a large structure at the rear of the cave. Whoever had taken the time to cut this relic was long dead. So were the men after him and after them. I didn't need a translator to know what I saw. It was a temple, and an evil one at that. I felt the oppressiveness of it like someone breathing down my neck. Like someone stood behind me, towering over my shoulders. I felt it like a shadow. The stench was stronger here too. Strong enough to make Harris puke and Maxwell faint. I covered my nose with my sleeve and tried to see how we could get down. If any insurgents were on the cave floor, we couldn't see them. Neither could we see Jasper. The only thing revealed was that there was no way of getting down other than a ledge 50 feet below. Relieved that no insurgents were at arms and still somewhat jacked up on adrenaline, we decided to go back and call in the casualties and our findings. But to my horror, we couldn't go back. The hole in the rock formation didn't allow it. We were stuck. It's funny how certain things can remind you of other times. Do you remember when we went camping in the Lake District? It was in the middle of winter. Frost coated the ground like icing on a cake. The hills and vastness was something we'd never experienced in London. We were happy. Cold, but happy. When our lights faded in the cave and the oppressive blackness settled in, It reminded me of that night we spent huddled in the tent. We stumbled around not being able to see a hand in front of our face because you forgot the light. I wouldn't change that night for the world, Mel. I learned your body by touch. Memorized every inch of your body by the goosebumps running under your skin. That allowed me to envision you every time I've closed my eyes since. It also reminded me of that chilly night sky. Millions of stars prevailed, just like the glow of creatures on the cave ceiling. The illumination showed us a path we hadn't seen. A series of rough cut holes in the wall leading to the floor. One by one we descended into the madness. I've never felt so alone. The anxiety of being trapped rose electric through my nerves. I knew it was stupid. I'd been trained for this, mentally and physically. But still, walking with my hand on the shoulder of the guy in front of me through those dusty buildings kept the spike of its electric finger jabbing my heart. I don't know how far we went or how long. The darkness stole that from us. But at some point the crackle of the radio split the air. We disassembled and curled around the one working radio. The crackle played a wave of static. A few partially heard words and then more static. The guys brightened and steered us in a new direction. I didn't hear that, Mel. I heard something else. The same thing Anderson heard out on the post. Sitting in the confines of the tent with your unit around you can waver most of what you thought you saw or heard to a disillusioned motion of momentary madness. I asked myself a thousand times if what I heard was real, and if it was real, how I'd heard it. I didn't know Arabic. I couldn't possibly have understood the words I heard in the static of the radio. 
but I did. I knew what the scribble of Anderson's hands had unveiled, but I dared not look. If I did, I knew it would be real, as real as this letter makes it now. I didn't eat or sleep that day. I just pretended to be asleep so my unit would leave me be. I heard them talk. Some about loved ones at home. Some about what they missed or the progression of their football team. I thought about you and Bobby. I thought about the ring I asked you to keep for him and the letters I've sent before this one. I'm writing this now, Mel, because I'm being put out on the post tonight. I've heard the rumors about the mass graves. I've seen the underground city. I've felt the presence and the smell and the boy on the hill. And I know what it means. This place is evil. We're told to keep our death letters up to date. And so this is mine. I love you, Melody. I can't wait to spend another moonless night together so I can memorize your skin again. I love you, Bobby. Can't wait to kick a soccer ball or hear you speak. But if not, be kind to mom. If she's upset, show understanding. If she's angry, show restraint. If she's sad, show compassion. I love you, son. With all my love, Travis. He was right. I hear the screams. They're all in trouble. They're burning. They're all burning. The boy's real. He's the one, the one doing this. We shouldn't have come. It's all our fault. For more information, including pictures and videos of the stories told on this podcast, please visit creepypod.com. If you'd like to submit a story for consideration or recommend a story, please see our submission page at creepypod.com slash submissions. All stories told on this podcast are done so through Creative Commons share-alike licensing or with written consent from the authors. No portion of this podcast may be rebroadcast or otherwise distributed without the express written consent of the Creepy Podcast production team and the story's author. The Bloody Disgusting Podcast Network. Home of Creepy for disturbing and terrifying creepy pastas. SCP Archives with full cast storytelling. Horror Queers, genre commentary from the LGBTQ perspective. The Blue Crew for horror centric interviews. Listen free wherever you stream audio and at bloodydisgusting.com slash podcasts.